Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final talk of this year's Almost Heaven Star Party 2019. Uh, it's Bruce Knob. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. John Kroon, who's uh, an avid amateur astrophotographer. Uh, I think professionally his doctorate was in physics, is that right? Astrophysics, specifically. And in astrophysics, uh, working in other fields now, but still um, being able to uh, apply his trade as a high-class amateur astrophotographer. Um, there are others of us who know the, uh, the pain of having gone through grad school and astronomy and ending up doing something else. On the other hand, you sometimes rapidly get enough money to do what you wanted to do astronomy by doing something else, and hopefully that's the case with John. So with that, please welcome John Kroon. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to talk to you today about um, narrowband astrophotography. Some of you may be astronomers. You like looking through the eyepiece and seeing for yourself uh, all the beauties that the night sky has to offer. You might uh, have dabbled in the art of broadband or, or regular astrophotography, as it were, taking exposures with a, a DSLR camera or other dedicated astrophotography cameras. I'm here to talk about um, a small piece of the, the over overall astrophotography art uh, called narrowband, of course. It is something that I hope by the end of my talk um, I will have convinced you to see the beauty and intrinsic value of and to possibly even motivate you to try it if you have not already. So a, a couple of the, the biggest benefits of doing narrowband astrophotography is it can enhance contrast or nebulosity in various um, targets uh, such as seen here with the bubble nebula. Uh, you could also image further into the lunar cycle. Typically, once uh, you start flirting with first quarter, time to put the DSLRs away because it's just going to be too bright to uh, pick out anything really worth uh, staying up late into the night for, as you all may know. Also, the pervasive light pollution that it's so hard to get away from, although we're lucky to be away from it here. Sometimes we like to take a few images, a few exposures from home. And uh, the light pollution is, is, as you know, it's, it's, it's a big problem for your images. But with narrowband, as we'll see, it's going to be able to block out a lot of continuum light that would otherwise uh, saturate your image uh, rather quickly. So the scope is, I'm not going to deal with specific cameras and OTAs. I'm not going to go into the nuances of um, imaging in narrowband with a particular rig. I feel like that would defocus from the art of narrowband itself too much. And uh, there's such a v variation uh, already in what, what gear everyone has or might have anyways. I want to deal with narrowband itself. So and we're also not going to do any data processing, walkthroughs. Uh, we're going to deal with the benefits and results of narrowband, talk about why you would use narrowband and when. And also, uh, I've attempted to gear this talk for the absolute beginner and in hopes that even the intermediate photographers um, might get something out of this as well. For an advanced astrophotographer, I would consider this as a recap that might still be uh, entertaining to you as well. Uh, uh, specifically, I'm also going to um, focus on hydrogen alpha, oxygen 3, and sulfur 2 narrowband filters. So I'm going to talk about a bit about the background and theory that is relevant to this discourse. Uh, camera sensor considerations, again, just sensors at large, no specific camera or any of its features and spec specifications. The narrow band benefits and aspects to consider. And then uh, we'll also talk about the shortcomings of narrow band because nothing is perfect for everything. There's always pros and cons. And then we'll summarize. So broad, typical broadband targets, you have three general categories. You could have star clusters, and those are even, of course, subdivided into globular and open clusters. This is a picture I took of M13 from my neighborhood in Fairfax. Uh, M uh, sorry, the, then you have galaxies here showcasing the Leo triplet, which I took with uh, John Soika out in um, Sky Meadows uh, this year. And this is not mine here. This is the Iris Nebula, which is a broadband um, or reflection nebula. So these all emit over the continuum uh, uh, of light. 
all the all the colors of the continuum of the visible light they could that they emit in. And then of course we have narrow band targets, which uh, have generally speaking these three categories: emission nebulae. That's the elephant's trunk nebula. I took I actually took all three of these. Um, and then you have Thor's helmet, which is a planetary or, or wolf riot nebula. And then the crab nebula, which is a supernova remnant. Now these all emit at discrete wavelengths primarily. Their spectrum decomposition shows strong emission lines centered around various atomic gas emissions. And so these, e these atomic emissions are due to atomic excitations um, when an uh, ultraviolet photon impinges upon these gases that are prevalent in the nebula. So here's a proposed band pass uh, definition. So broadband would probably start somewhere around anything greater than 70 nanometers full width half max, or FWHM. Intermediate is like 12 to 70, maybe uh, towards the lower end of that. Narrow band, uh, 11 nanometers or so, or and less would be what you would typically buy um, from OptCorp or whatnot. And then you have ultra narrow band. If you get the Astrodons, you get like a three nanometer. Those are you c those are often sometimes called uh, line emission filters. You can actually split the H alpha and N2. There's a N2 emission line so close to H alpha if you you're including both with a 12 nanometer filter. So some of the things light does, uh, I had to put the, the Pink Floyd thing in here because uh, every time I see it, I, I think of astrophotography, not Pink Floyd. Then I think of Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, of course, that white light is composed of all the colors of the continuum of light. Uh, suppose you have, consider, consider you have a hot black body radiator. It could be a star, for example, and it's emitting a continuum of light. And you pass it through the prism, you'll get the continuum spectrum. But if, you, if that light passes through a, a cool gas cloud, the light can excite the gas at their characteristic frequencies and be subtracted from that continuum spectrum, leaving behind gaps. This is an absorption spectrum. And uh, similarly, you could pass some of the light that the cloud itself emits after being excited from the continuum. And you'll get just these discrete wavelengths of light that are correspondent to whatever characteristic frequencies of light are in that cloud of gas, hydrogen or whatnot. So here's a, a nice animation I borrowed from Soika. Uh, here you could see the, the various colors of the continuum light from the star approaching a hydrogen atom, and uh, whichever photon has the exact perfect energy to cause a quantum leap from a ground state to a higher a state, you could see the electron here jump up to that second ring whenever that, um, that colored arrow hits it. And then due to quantum effects, it will then spontaneously decay back down to the state it was in before. And to conserve energy, it has to emit that same photon that it gathered in the first place. So this is the Rosette Nebula seen in hydrogen alpha, which is a uh, wavelength of light corresponding to 656 nanometers and it's generated from this exact process uh, with an, a, an atom of, of hydrogen. So major filter types, if you're trying, yeah. I, I you a question. Sure. This is a good slide and probably for every, everybody else. We, we just know uh, that the Earth's atmosphere is about 30 times the mass of the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. So the So it's you're, you're asking a quantum mechanics question, and uh, which is intimately uh, related. It's the bread and butter of astrophysicists. So I could tell you that uh, if you look at what's called the Sahai equation, which gives you the, the relative abundance of states of, of uh, an atomic species in a radiation bath, essentially, it's they're bathing in this continuum um, radiation light from the, the star cluster itself. You, you, you run the equations, you, run, you do the math, and you find that hydrogen alpha is just a prominent line. And uh, it, it's a statistical problem as well. So you're not going to see enough light 
uh, along the entire series to really do any imaging from. So there, there very well may be, you, you actually can do hydrogen beta imaging on this. I think it's just very weak and it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it doesn't do the, the nebula justice, I think. So it's, it's, it's one part quantum mechanics and two parts aesthetics and practicality. But those, those emission lines are in principle present in some quantity or another. Absolutely. Uh, if, if there were closer stars, for example, and the stars were had more energy, mm -hmm. might get a different model. It, it could also depend on the the thermodynamics of the gas cloud. If the uh, uh, hydrogen get too cool and dense, they start forming H two, which is of course a hydrogen molecule. The Balmer series does not apply to molecules. You have a different ele uh, electron cloud configuration. You're going to get uh, more complex um, atomic spectral features from a molecule uh, as opposed to just a simple atom by itself. So th those uh, could be good. It's not just a question of having a brighter nearby star. You have to have a nearby star that has a higher concentration of shortwave energy to pump up the higher energy star from which the blue comes out. So if this is a quiet, if whenever it's a quiet neighborhood, you're going to get age out. You're in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> okay, so if you want to stick with the broadband idea and because you want to image objects that primarily emit across the spectrum, but you want to simply remove the what's called the light pollution notch. So typically in the, in the suburbs you have the, the, uh, the sodium high and low pressure lamps, the orangish yellow lamps. And so right here in the orange and yellow region you could simply have a filter device that that does not uh, pass those wavelengths through. And so you could do a lot of good work in the neighborhood just um, with, with these broader band light pollution filters. Then there's slightly more narrow band or nebula filters if you're, if you're imaging a nebula such as the Thor's helmet. And it's a very strong in hydrogen and oxygen, but not much else. You could throw a nebula filter on and be done with it all in one fell swoop. Or you can do line or nebula filters which select a single emission line if you want to increase the contrast or highlight certain features that are interesting astrophysically in your art in your target then you can get uh, a line filter uh, and and that'll that'll do the job for you it just selects a, a specific line or two if they're super close together so components of sky glow things uh, to think about we we get so often we get uh, talking about light pollution we forget that there's uh, several different uh, components to it there's the man-made lighting like mercury vapor and the sodium lamps and uh, now they're even coming out with the, the blue LEDs which could be a, a big problem uh, because these these uh, uh, mercury and, and sodium lamps are essentially um, our filters in reverse. They're, they're pumping out these uh, narrow line emission features and we could then uh, devise filters that just go around them and subtract those but the continuum light from blue LEDs could, could be a problem. I digress. Natural air glow, oxygen, uh, upper atmospheric effects, exotic things and too nuanced for me to get into here and then interplanetary dust and unresolved starlight just um, scattered light essentially. Um, from dust or just off of clouds um, in your local vicinity. So the hydrogen Balmer series, so this is what uh, Soika brought up, talking about hydrogen beta, um, this teal colored one at 486. Hydrogen alpha, which I'll talk about a lot today, is at 656, it's that nice red color. And then we have uh, blue and violet and even, even getting closer to the ultraviolet. These lines, by the way, correspond to uh, state transitions from higher ground states, or sorry, higher excited states down to the, um, the ground state where the red one being the lowest energy is the, an adjacent um, state transition from N equals two to N equals one. And so this would be an emission spectrum and on the bottom that would be the uh, corresponding absorption of uh, uh, a gas, uh, gas comprised of, of, of hydrogen. 
So what do I mean by, we talk about lines all the time. What, what are they? I thought it'd be neat to just remind ourselves w what, what we mean by lines. So it comes from diffraction gratings. Anytime you have a wave passing through a slit, such as uh, a wave through a, a small opening leading into a bay or a laser passing through in a la optics laboratory through a, d a diffraction grating, you could see very clearly how it's split off into different um, a, a sequence of bright and dark patches which are resultant from interference of the wave with itself. You could have constructive and destructive interference and based on the geometry you'll get these um, spacings um, n equals zero, one, two, three and so on. They get dimmer as you go high to higher orders. Um, and so I, would, I wanted to point out, so here's another cartoon version of that where the, the spectrum is generated from the diffraction grating. The so lines come from the shape of the diffraction grating, and it's uh, those, those vertical slits that produce the effect. You could have also used smiley face diffraction gratings. I had a, a friend in grad school who actually succeeded in making uh, a smiley face diffraction pattern, but we couldn't tell if we were looking at hydrogen alpha or beta, so we scrapped it and went back to regular ones. <laughs> Stick with lines. They're there for simplicity. And so here is a, a picture of what hydrogen gas looks like glowing with all of the lines uh, that it emits combined. <coughs> it's this beautiful magenta color, not unlike the Rosette Nebula, actually, although that's mostly H alpha. Uh, so there we have the 656 and so on down to 410, and there's even some ul uh, weak ultraviolet lines that it emits. So if you wanted to combat the various uh, sources of light pollution, see we have sodium street lamps as the solid uh, um, orangish yellow line, uh, incandescent, and then the fluorescent mercury. We have sulfur two, which is even redder than H alpha. We'll get to that more in a moment. H alpha is here and O3 is here. And you'll notice that there's s prevalent light uh, pollution flux at, at each of these locations relative to the the peak signal strength of those filters. We'll talk more about how this um, is not a problem in the grand scheme of things in a moment. Well, for the sake of the beginners, could you explain what the two and sulfur two means? And the and yeah, it's so funny. Look at this. Naming ionization <laughs> states. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, too. I planned ahead. <laughs> so, so Roman numerals are used. Um, you subtract the, the, the key. Here's the golden rule. This is all you need to know. Subtract one from the how many Roman numerals you have to get to the actual how many electrons have been removed. So, uh, for example, oxygen three, whoa, oxygen three is oxygen with two missing valence electrons. Three minus one is two. And so you see here oxygen is happy to give up two valence electrons if you pump enough of the right energy wavelength into it. Pop quiz, how many electrons have been removed from neon one? None, that's just neon, so we don't usually say neon one unless we're talking uh, specifically in the context of some sort of uh, um, nebula ionization state study. So that's, uh, okay, so here's for regular matter, we have, um, it's mostly hydrogen and there's a, a considerable chunk of helium four and there's this nice slit, that's where me and you live, that's us, plus some of the hydrogen that, com that makes up the water that we have in us, but all the heavier elements are here. So I conclude that a hydrogen filter would be a good uh, filter to have because look at how much of the universe has it and is invariably being excited by nearby starlight in some situations. Helium-4 isn't used as much, at least not with um, recreational astrophotography. You could get up to the scientific pr and professional grade levels and get some really fancy like neon filters and helium filters. And they're just, um, they're, those lines are usually weak and, and only a few objects emit them, you, uh, typically planetary nebula and some uh, uh, supernova remnants. But as I, I, I had my tracks covered from the beginning when I, I promised you I'd only focus on hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. And so um, that having been said, there are many elements that are used, um, many filters for other elements in the heavier elements category. That is to say, the metals. Uh, astronomers and chemists butt heads sometimes because uh, to astronomers on the periodic tables, just hydrogen and helium and everything else is a metal, including oxygen. Chemists don't like to hear that. <laughs> I have some chemist friends. I, I bug them all the time. 
Okay, so sensor quantum efficiency, this is a whole talk in itself, but I just wanted to sort of give you a flavor. All things being equal for a given photon frequency and at unity gain, you get so many photoelectrons read out for uh, however many incident photons struck that sensor pixel. And uh, they're uh, essentially a function of the intrinsic properties of the sensor. Is it CMOS, CCD, or film even? Um, and the Bayer sensor matrix, which can affect the total effective quantum efficiency, which I'll um, explain now. So the Bayer matrix, in order to take pictures of whatever, you know, birthday parties and trees and whatnot, and you want it in color, and uh, it's a, it's a one-shot color camera. It has all the red, green, and blue pixels, just like a TV has. Um, so if you have incoming light, red, green, and blue, and it strikes this sensor array, um, they, it'll select only the appropriate colors. Red goes to red, green, green, blue, blue. And you end up with this uh, pattern of uh, red pixels that have been excited, green and blue, and uh, you'll get a resulting pattern. Then your software debayers and you get a, a clean image that's not all pixelated and funky looking. So if you wanted to take a modified DSLR camera and attempt some of your first initial uh, uh, tries at narrowband astrophotography, and I do recommend you try that, even though I'm about to tell you not to, for the following reason. If you use narrowband imaging with a color camera, look what happens. You have a hydrogen alpha filter, let's say, in front of the sensor, which has a Bayer matrix on it. So you have all this incoming light. It could be light pollution or even some other light from the nebula you're imaging, but in this instance, you're only gathering the H alpha, it will only allow that H alpha red light through and then the green and blue pixels will not be excited by that red photon. So you're left with uh, a few red pixels in your sensor rate and then nothing and nothing. And so these are empty. So if you were to calculate your quantum efficiency, it's, it's, a, f it's a quarter um, of whatever your normalized total um, quantum efficiency is. So you're reducing that by a factor of four. You have to image a lot longer to compensate and uh, you could have some uh, visual artifacts that result from doing so. However, if you use a monochrome camera, now there's only one pixel we need to look at because they're all the same type and they don't have a Bayer filter in front of it. The uh, light pollution and other nebulous light is filtered out and the red light from hydrogen is passing through and they're all, uh, all the pixels are illuminated where such an event has taken place. So 100% of the pixels in which a uh, hydrogen alpha photon hits it are used up to the uh, sensor's intrinsic quantum efficiency. So at least you still have to deal with the, the quantum efficiency of your sensor, but you're not reducing it even further by having that Bayer matrix in the way. So here's some of the uh, a nice visualization showing how it going from, remember when we talked about broadband and then intermediate and then the narrower filters, so here's like if you were to use a wide red or orange filter on the crescent nebula in Cygnus, you could just barely pick out some of the brighter segments around it. Narrow red, you could see more. And so on nine, nine nanometer hydrogen alpha, you see a good deal of almost the whole nebula's uh, primary form. But in the when you get down to the six nanometer, you could start seeing some nebulosity uh, around it and this very tenuous dim gas that uh, the crescent nebula is embedded in. And at four nanometers band pass, you, you're picking up even more of it. It's a little bit challenging to see in this brightly lit room, of course, but um, you have uh, the general trend of uh, broader filters, you get less contrast, narrower filters, you get enhanced contrast for a nebula that emits at those wavelengths. I want to be clear about that. Be sure to use narrow band on sources that emit those spectral lines. You can just look it up or uh, maybe you already are familiar with it. Broadband targets like galaxies typically don't need narrow band because they emit all light from all the, all the stars combined and so they're the most broad band you can get essentially, such as M33 or the Triangulum Galaxy, such as this one. The colors are showing up a little bit funky from the native on, on my laptop, but this is a picture I took um, earlier in January of this year with a DSLR just regular, no, not even a light pollution filter. I was out at a park and I, 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 got, I got this. And then I went back and put on an H alpha filter and l did some luminance layering and got this. Now you can see much more clearly these uh, pink blotches, uh, pretty well defined 
these are H2 regions. These, this, is, this is the Triangulum Galaxies uh, Orion Nebulas and, and Rosette Nebulas, all these uh, bright uh, pinkish red um, H2 regions emitting H alpha uh, light. So again, here's before. You can see only the brightest one. This is actually NGC 604. It's the largest nebula like we know of, like anywhere. It's like uh, a lot bigger even than our Orion Nebula. And here's with the H alpha. So you can do narrowband on broadband targets, maybe targets you've already imaged, but you want to um, add some pizzazz. So here's uh, what an uh, oxygen three filter might do, a line filter on the, the veil nebula shown on the left without any filter used. Uh, it's almost uh, indiscernible against the, the sky glow. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, use is something I borrowed from some gentleman, but it's a 10 inch F5.6 Newtonian uh, at a dark sky, too. This is not even like it from the city. But he throws on the oxygen three line filter, and it, you could see uh, clearly the nebulosity uh, that emits at those uh, characteristic frequencies. So, again, here is um, how you can see the enhancement of using H-alpha, so we, we looked at oxygen a moment ago. So this is uh, the Horsehead and Flame Nebula. And again, it's kind of bright in here, but um, essentially there's, it's, it's a great image, and there's plenty of uh, gaseous nebulosity, but it's sort of smooth, and the minutia of details are seen better in this image, which you could see the clumpiness in here and the streamers in this region to the right of this cloud, there's these like streamers. You could see like almost tendrils, which uh, are more easily picked out with uh, the, the use of a H alpha filter. Sulfur imaging. Sulfur is typically a, a dim, um, it's, it's, it's a dim species to image in, but it is useful. S and it it's tends to be a little bit more rare than hydrogen and oxygen in terms of uh, population number. And you need at least, uh, if you're imaging, or let's just say a solid F6, you'd, you'd want to do about 10 minutes of exposure, 10 minute uh, exposures on your subs. But that's not a hard and fast rule. It's typically somewhere you want to start at. For example, I'm giving this to, as an example to contrast from broadband where you would get, you'd be fine with uh, one minute or 90 seconds or two or three minutes uh, on whatever your target was. But for narrowband, when you're cutting out a lot of light and your signal is intrinsically weak, you're going to want uh, longer exposures. Um, if imaging with a faster, faster scope, uh, you, could, you could reduce the exposure time if you'd like. Uh, and part in particular, I image at f4.9. I usually get away with seven or eight minute subs. I've even done some six minute subs on brighter um, targets. So a note on focal ratio. All things being equal, it's a quadratic relationship between two different focal ratios that you are considering imaging with uh, for um, a given exposure time T1. So here's the formula. You just take the ratio and square it and multiply by your original um, exposure time. For example, suppose you take a five minute exposure at F5 and you want to uh, put on that wide field refractor and it's an F10. Uh, well, how long should you expose in order to get uh, roughly the same values? Well, 10 divided by 5 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 4 times the original 5 minutes is 20 minutes. So you would, so since it's quadratic process, it, it, ha it, um, it doesn't take much until you're, 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 so you're soaking up a lot of light, keeping that shutter open for a lot longer, which introduces other problems like guiding, tracking, and satellites uh, passing through your frame. So typically you want to try to keep the exposures a little bit shorter if you can. The next application of uh, narrowband imaging is to use the Hubble palette. And now I could not do a narrowband talk without showing the famous e uh, pillars of creation and the Eagle Nebula, um, the Hubble palette so-called uh, because Hubble popularized the, the color mapping that was used in this particular subject, the pillars of creation. So here are some of my images. Um, you map sulfur to red, it's because it's in red, so is hydrogen alpha, but it's less red. And you, you let the hydrogen be green, and then the oxygen be blue. So SHO goes to RGB, so there's your, your mapping order. This is the uh, Cygnus wall, it's a part of the North America nebula. And then we have also the Elephant Trunk Nebula, which I took with my 8-inch reflector. 
And here from the um, first slide again is the Swan Nebula in the Hubble palette. So there's a, a few common myths I wanted to dispel. If, if you had such a thought creep up in your mind, I wanted to um, dispel it at this time. Light pollution filters eliminate light pollution. False or not quite. They reduce sky glow by rejecting those, um, those photons, but they do not get rid of all of it especially under severe light pollution. Filters work best under light pollution because you're, you're getting more bang for your buck. You're, you're rejecting all that light that you want to get rid of but can't do anything about. False, they, they actually work better under darker skies like anything else. There's nothing mystical about narrowband filters. It's just uh, a matter of counting photons, essentially. Filters make nebulae brighter. False, nothing can make a nebula brighter like in any uh, fundamental way other than just gathering more light and uh, maybe doing a curves adjustment but the filters just improve the contrast you want to think about in terms of contrast blocking out more light pollution like we saw with the veil nebula and the oxygen 3 filter it, it sort of brought it out nicer when the background sky glow was diminished filters are only useful in eight inch and larger apertures because they uh, these things are so dim uh, in a small refractor, you, you just you wouldn't get enough light to really uh, build any signal up in a reasonable amount of time. Also false, um, filters don't dim the nebulosity. Again, they increase contrast and reject some light that you don't want. But they are useful in scopes from 50 millimeters on up. Um, it, it might be better to take longer exposures if you're using a, a smaller scope or a slower scope. But uh, you might fare better if you simply go to a darker sky site. C number two. <laughs> Narrow band filters, I'm sorry, this one's kind of dim, but this is the Rosette Nebula with a DSLR camera. I didn't take this in the next two images. This is just the H alpha. Here's the S2. They look the same, they're very similar colors, but there actually is a, a small difference in what parts of the nebula it picks up. Again, sorry, it's hard to see because again, contrast. And then here's the, the uh, O3. It just looks like blue stars, I'm sorry, but there is some tenuous nebulosity amongst all that. You put it together and you get this. This is R to sulfur, green is hydrogen alpha, blue, oxygen three. Um, but my favorite uh, image rendering of the Rosette Nebula is this one, which is taken by one John Soika Jr. sitting right here, silly guy. And it's uh, the best, uh, it's my personal favorite uh, using this exact color palette mapping composite. So the, the, the narrow band imaging cons, uh, I, I, you know, we have to talk about these briefly to be complete. So the filters do cut out a significant amount of light. And so um, that requires longer exposures, especially if you're using s uh, slower scopes or sm uh, smaller apertures. So longer exposures require excellent tracking. And uh, you almost definitely are going to need to enhance your tracking with auto guiding. So then that's uh, more gear to worry about buying and getting configured, more drivers, more things that could go wrong at night. It's just increasing complexity that you have to sort of be aware of and be uh, have making sure everything's under control. Things can go wrong. Your, your guiding won't work very well. Again, even auto guiding isn't a one hit wonder. It's a tool that can be used under certain circumstances to enhance your um, imaging experience. And it needs uh, your, your scope, your rig needs to be very well polar aligned and also well balanced. If, y if you're very poorly balanced, you could, you could damage your, your gears over time anyways. Uh, avoid stresses on the mount. Uh, filters for different emission wavelengths could have different focuses. They're not par focal, so you switch from hydrogen alpha to O3, and you just image. You set up a two-hour imaging run. You take a nap. You get up. You tear down. You go to bed for real, and then the uh, lunch tomorrow, you realize all of your O3 shots are, are garbage because they were just slightly out of focus, and you couldn't tell till you zoomed way in and really looked at it under proper lighting at home in the daylight. So you want to re remember to refocus or at least check your focus. Uh, a Batnov mask is a quick and easy way of doing that on the field just to make sure you're getting the, the most out of the time you're spending. Yeah. So you can't focus on a nebula, so you just focus on a bright star with enough energy to Yeah, if you're lucky, a bright star will already be in there. There's a, uh, a few bright ones in Rosette. 
But what I usually do is I'll just slew to like Deneb or, or Vega or whatever the brightest star is in the sky and, and then just and then change my binning to four by four. And then I only need to take like a three to five second exposure. If I stay one by one binning, I'm gonna need like a 30 second exposure at least. And then, and then that's 30 seconds every time you, you um, change the focus. So do four by four binning, it's just a little a t tip that I, I, I like to do. And uh, then slew back to your target. You can do a plate solve and center it again and you're off, you're off and off to the races. Uh, so that, that's what I do. But again, sometimes you get lucky and there's a star right there in your field of uh, frame and you could get away with a 10 second exposure and true up your, your focus and, and get on your way. Also, the moonlight autofocusers that John and I have uh, work pretty well at, at taking some of the, the brunt work out of it for you and automating things with uh, Sequence gener Generator Pro. But that is beyond the scope of this talk. Okay, some tips. So since oxygen three is in that bluish green, it's like a teal color. So in a DSLR camera, if you ever image with the O3 filter, you'll notice you have, uh, of course, your red channel is, is pretty much zeroed out, but you have blue and green because the camera picks it up, picks up the, the, the oxygen three photons is kind of blue and green. And it's like a, it's called a linear combination of states. So you get, you get two channels you gotta process. Uh, before you move on to the next one. So uh, bluish is, is more, uh, bluer colors are more susceptible to light from the moon. Um, so avoid imaging O3 between first and third quarters if you can, if you can avoid it. To mitigate this, image on the opposite part of the sky. So in the northern hemisphere, the, the moon, you know, passes due south, but it could be southeast or southwest depending on, you know, what time of the night it is. So suppose you you, you're prescient of that and you decide I'm going to image something that has O3 in it, a, a neat nebula off to the northeast or northwest. And so as long as there's not a lot of uh, cla like any haziness over here that can reflect the moonlight back in from the northern part of the sky, you should be relatively clear. I've done it all the time, uh, imaging even during a, a waxing gibbous uh, with oxygen-3. Um, Save oxygen three imaging for time for when your target is as high in the sky as possible. It's the same reason that uh, the sky is blue, the bluer colors scatter more, and so you're gonna you're gonna preserve the signal better if there's as less scattering as possible. Um, so you keep that in mind. You plan your imaging night out. You say, I'm gonna start off with sulfur two. Sulfur two is even redder than H alpha. And your, your target is just, just barely high enough in the sky and your ants, you just open that shutter and get going. So you just do the sulfur two, get all your frames done that you want for that night, then go to H alpha and your target isn't even at the meridian yet. And it's at its highest point, boom, switch to O3 and you should be good to go. Soak up some decent signal uh, near the meridian. Um, so like I said, imaging the deepest red first is, is typically best if it starts out rising in the night sky. But if your target, as soon as it's dark enough to image, if it's already up at the zenith or near the meridian, well then it's reverse. You start with O3 because it's already at its highest point and then as it gets lower, you can switch to the redder filters. It's just, uh, you could use all the help you can get in trying to make your images as best as possible, getting the cleanest data. So these are some of the things I recommend and I, and I do these myself. So a handy calculator. When I got here for this trip, I actually downloaded the Ioptron Polar Alignment app. It's this little app and you could uh, use it to get polar alignment on their SkyGuider Pro and SkyTracker Pro, but you could also stick it in your saddle of your main imaging rig and use it to get a rough polar alignment during the day. It uses the GP, uh, the the in the inertial motor units, the, the little gyroscopes in there, and the GPS signal to figure out when it's at the correct orientation, uh, left, right, and up, down to be near the the celestial pole. And so you could do that. And uh, anyway, I found a handy calculator on that same app, and uh, it's just uh, it was devised by this guy Michael Covington, and he's got a website here. And uh, it's, uh, this is what the interface looks like in the app and you could change, this is the surface brightness of the target you're imaging. There's a little uh, button you click over here to choose w what it is you're imaging by category, not, not by specific target name. And then the ISO, the filter factor, it's, it's like how much light are you cutting out? Is it like a three nanometer or is it a broadband light pollution filter or, or no filter? Uh, no filter at all has a factor of one. And then the focal ratio of your scope 
And I just plugged in these numbers and got 16 seconds. I think the 16 and a half factor was for some very bright uh, emission nebula. And so it was like, oh, you could image, and this is with no filter under dark skies at 1600 ISO. So they were like, oh, 16 seconds. But it's, uh, here's what the app icon looks like. And um, it's pretty handy if you wanted to uh, have something a little bit more quantitative from uh, the whole setup in order to sort of calculate what should your exposure lengths be. You, you don't want to just pick a random number. You should have a little bit of uh, an informed decision-making process. So in conclusion, bless you, narrowband blocks all but specific atomic emission lines. It does not subtract out light pollution at large. Some of it still gets through, because remember broadband or continuum light pollution exists at that exact frequency you're imaging. It has to, because it's fully, it's continuous across the spectrum, but it definitely blocks uh, a lot of that light out. It increases contrast by blocking that continuum light, but also highlights different structures as you're letting in certain uh, emissions from gases using the Hubble palette, where you can look at H2 regions of uh, galaxies that showcase their, their nebulosity as well, such as we saw with the Triangulum Galaxy. You could extend your imaging time further into the lunar phase um, by, um, by, by virtue of, of, of what the filters are doing with that light from the moon. And you could image a little bit more easily and, and successfully in light polluted areas. Um, by the way, Half of the narrowband images I showed you that were my own, I took from my front yard where, uh, so I'm in Fairfax, but there are um, five street lamps on the other side of the street, some 30 feet away. And if you do the trig, they're at the, the perfect angle to shine down my tube when I'm looking east. And I still managed to, uh, to defeat it. It was either that or I took a rock to him. I didn't want to get in trouble with the county or state. So narrowband is smart and that context especially. So bring a new look to your images as well by highlighting these, these gases and, and playing with the Hubble palette, a beautiful color mapping as you can no doubt agree. And, uh, and I hope uh, you've, you've seen the utility for narrowband imaging and uh, maybe you wanna give it a try sometime. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. So she said um, it's reasonable to see why hydrogen alpha filters are among the, the three that comprise the Hubble palette or just the three that are typically used by recreational astrophotographers, but why, like what is special or what, uh, what was the motivation for using uh, oxygen and, and sulfur? And uh, I, would, I would think it's just a matter of uh, these, these gases have just a natural prevalence in these, uh, in these nebulae where you have some embedded open star cluster that's exciting them all. And you, in particular, the, the bright emission nebulae where you have strong emission lines in these three gas species. I think it's just uh, uh, sort of a cosmic roll of the dice. There, there's just not just n not even a roll of the dice, but just the way that the uh, stellar nucleosynthesis tends to generate certain species of elements more than others. And uh, when they're uh, mixed in with the interstellar medium, and uh, embedded in a, um, a cluster that then excites the nebula, there's just not a lot of, like, uh, like we talked about the neon, there's just not a lot of neon there. And so uh, you choose the filters based on what's present. Yeah. So I have not, I'm actually on the, uh, sorry, the question was, do I have any experience with the nitrogen two filters? Um, and any comments on that essentially? I have not, but I, I would like to, as I, I mentioned in one of the slides, if you get the really narrow three or four nanometer bandpass filter for hydrogen alpha, um, you sub you, um, you're not including the nitrogen two line that's right next to it. And then I would have to then go and buy a nitrogen two filter 
and select it and bring another dimension, if you will, to uh, my images. But then I would have to also check which nebulae uh, in the northern hemisphere um, emit nitrogen to uh, photons. What color would that, yeah, go ahead. What color would, you assign? Uh, what color would I assign to it? I would probably make it red. And then if I'm using hydrogen alpha as well, I would keep that one green and then I would, I would do the oxygen if those three gases were prevalent in my subject. Yes? Yes, there's a book. And I, oh sorry, <laughs> the qu do I know of any resource that's good at uh, as a quick handy reference book for finding what, um, what gases are prevalent in a given nebula? Um, there's a book I have, I'm, I don't know what it's called actually. <laughs> but what I typically do is I just Google it really, it's, it's a pretty handy thing, or ask Siri. I'll say, I, I was making breakfast one time, I said, hey Siri, what? Uh, gases are prevalent in the in Thor's helmet, and she said, "Do you want me to order you s some pizza?" I was like, "No." <laughs> 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 and I had to repeat it very clearly, and I just gave up and I typed it into Google. And uh, Wikipedia is great as well; they have some uh, resources, uh, the footnotes that show you the references that appear in text. Typically, you could uh, click those hyperlinks. And, and check those out. I'm sorry, uh, I'll look up that book and I'll get back to you afterwards. Um, okay, that is I pretty cool. I also suggest often there is an amateur by the name of Dr. Nicely, N-I-S-E-L-Y. Nice he thing. has several articles on the Cloudy Nights website where he is using uh, narrow band filters for particular objects and, and specifies which ones seem to do the best in terms of bringing out the light just as you're describing. And that might be a nice supplement to your book, especially for amateurs who have limited equipment and limited uh, ability to diversify. Absolutely. By the way, I think I just remembered, I don't, although I don't remember the author, uh, the, the book title is top one, The Top 100 Best Astrophotography Targets. There's only 100, but that'll keep you busy for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Absolutely. Uh, he was saying that uh, there's no reason just to stick with SHO to RGB. You could, uh, you know, the world is your oyster. Just mix it up to see what happens. Experiment. That's part of the fun. And you can get some very interesting looking results. I've done it myself. I got some that had like purple and gold and like almost like psychedelic, like neon, like Las Vegas stuff going on. Um, but I will also uh, mention, uh, I, I should have included in here is the HOO for a target that just does not have any sulfur or it's just super weak. The Crescent Nebula is a great example and Thor's Helmet. You could do, uh, they, these, these two targets only have uh, prominent hydrogen and, and oxygen lines, uh, but you need a th that third channel there so you just uh, put oxygen in both uh, the green and blue, because after all it, it is a greenish blue color anyway, so it kind of works out. So HOO is another good, uh, good way to, to try to do some I imaging composites. Yes? Will it make the stars white if you use the HOO color scheme? Uh, if I, I could answer your question in this way. If you ever get, uh, I, I might be reading between the lines, but are you in uh, referencing the, 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 the magenta stars that you get? So all, all you need to do for that is invert your image and run a gr uh, an uh, SCNR in PixInsight on the green channel. That's the selective color noise reduction. Then reinvert it back and voila, white stars. So if you get problems like that where you're using these HOOs, you're playing around with the colors, you get magenta, invert it, do 100% SCNR on the green channel, reinvert it, and you're done. Soika.
bang ideas off of each other. There's one that I recently thought of that I said I'm going to save for this week so everybody hears it. I'm going to get a good answer. Uh, so when I'm out there and I'm trying to determine the ratio of gain to offset, so I capture the signal and I give it gain, and then I play with the offset, but only through playing with the offset do I probably get an image. Sometimes it can scrub. What is a good way to determine, a simple way to determine gain to offset ratios so your CCD camera registers those, those uh, uh, lines? Okay, so essentially he's asking me uh, what everyone's asking, and no one has like a formula for it. Uh, but his question is essentially, when you're changing your, the gain of your CCD camera to suit your imaging needs, uh, there's an offset that has to be appropriately chosen so your zero point is correct so you don't have uh, round off errors and everything's dark. Um, what I use, uh, there's, there's a, a tabulated uh, sort of cheat sheet that's uh, proliferated through the internet, I think, starting out by John Riesta on Cloudy Nights. And it's a table with the four most common gain settings and the correct offset value. Now I've been playing around with that and I actually plotted it and interpolated it and have actually um, created a, f a function uh, uh, that, that allows me to calculate just right off the bat what my offset should be for an arbitrary uh, gain setting that's not on this chart. I'll, I, could, I could give that to you later if you'd like. And I could post it to some resource that, that others could use if, if they so wish. Isn't that just an issue of making sure you're optimally using your dynamic range? Absolutely. That's so definitely a big part of it. Capture all the individual filter bands with an optimal setting, which you can almost do by yourselves, then you can fix it in post processing. Because in post processing, you want the gains to be back to the same. Otherwise, you're getting strange pictorial characteristics. You're getting artistic, you're not getting representative. Right. But ultimately, you want to. Whatever the three bands is, you probably want them the same during processing. In, in acquisition, you mm -hmm. want to maximize your dynamic range. Yeah. You can get a bunch of numbers at that point. There you can play with the numbers however much you want in post production. But if you're clipping in, in, in acquisition, it's all right. Uh, so the, the one thing that I would say matters is uh, what the uh, noise. Uh, Baseline uh, sky blue and that type of stuff uh, can affect what your black point is. Uh, and that's going to vary. It's not going to be in the table. Right. There are, there are calculators I, I found. Uh, have, you, have you guys ever heard of the, the lightvortex.com? There's actually a, a, a calculator you could download. It's, it's in Excel. And they have you um, use uh, PixInsight or some other resource to calculate based on your, your, what your camera's gain is and the background flux and what your exposure is. And, it'll, and there's like 10 different uh, fields you have to fill in uh, using flats and darks and other support frames like bias. It'll tell you what the optimum exposure should be. And that's a, it's more robust than the little app on uh, the calculator app, I should. Well, you mentioned something else there. If you know, if you were to know what your background level is, then you could set it based on calculation. As you go from site to site, even though you're relatively immune to the natural radiation, natural continuum, or the man made continuum, it's still going to vary from place to place. Oh, yeah, sure. And if you really had, if you, if you were in space, you'd only have the readout points. Mm -hmm. uh, thermal noise and readout. But on the ground, the background is going to vary. So I think the, 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 the thing that John was sort of getting at is just making sure you're not clipping. He, he was talking about how it's all zeroed out, you got a blank image. So you can, uh, it using very, very few variables in a pretty base level scenario, select the correct uh, offset so that you can actually get something. And then your sky glow stuff, I usually just run a background extraction and, and fix and clean it up in, in pro post processing. Mm -hmm. You're experiencing intrinsic noise 
in the sub. Otherwise, you're oversampling the noise. Yeah. And that doesn't buy you. That's yeah. That's not good. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's let's thank John again. Yeah.